Oggi abbiamo il piacere di inaugurare l'anno accademico 2013 del International University College. Per quelli che non sapessero tutto dell'International dell University College, ma credo che qui so, sono tutti o quasi al corrente, devo dire che il, questo, questa istituzione molto importante di, per Torino è, è stata costituita nell'ormai lontano 2008 perché ci sembra che sia passato già tanto tempo il, e, e, questa, e, e, il corso pre, previsto da questa istituzione è biennale e dà il diritto al Master of Science in diritto economia e finanza comparata è aperto naturalmente a tutti gli aspiranti che siano laureati che, che vincano la selezione e abbiamo un vero circolo internazionale perché eh, ho letto che i partecipanti selezionati al corso appartengono ai, agli stati più svariati che vanno dal, dal Kenya alla Russia, alla Spagna, all'Ungheria, alla Giordania, al Turkmenistan, India, Uzbekistan, Singapore, Ucraina, Francia, Nigeria, Grecia, Vietnam, Moldavia, Cina, Argentina, eccetera, eccetera. E questa istituzione ha un, ha un livello di ormai internazionale, conosciuta dappertutto, basterebbe pensare che nel comitato scientifico ci sono delle personalità come Amartya Sen, che è un premio Nobel per l'economia, oppure eh, Kennedy, eh, il quale è eh, il professore il titolare della cattedra di giurisprudenza generale di Harvard, e c'è fra i docenti anche il preside emerito della School of Law dell'Università di Yale, Guido Calabresi. E poi abbiamo nel comitato scientifico anche il presidente emerito della Corte Costituzionale che è qui, il professor Gustavo Zagrebelski. Non posso tacere che questa grande istituzione ha principalmente due padri. Uno è il professor Ugo Mattei professore ormai noto della facoltà di giurisprudenza di Torino e della facoltà di Berkeley negli Stati Uniti d'America e la compagnia di San Paolo che fu la prima fedele alle sue tradizioni pluricentenarie che aiutò in modo decisivo la, questa istituzione agli esordi, istituzione che è stata naturalmente riconosciuta anche dalla regione e che ormai è conosciuta in tutto il mondo. Ma poi hanno collaborato tante istituzioni torinesi, dalla Fondazione della Cassa di Risparmio di Torino, alla Società Ferrero di Alba, eh, e tanti all'ordine del notarile, eh, le borse di studio di privati, per esempio cito solo quella del recente del Consiglio dell'Ordine degli Avvocati di Torino che l'ha intitolata a, a Fulvio Croce. Non voglio però rubare ancora più del vostro tempo e, ed è, mi sembra che sia inutile, sarebbe persino il riguardoso dire, dirvi chi è il professor Salvatore Settis che le, ci darà, eh, ci le, pronuncerà la, le, la lezione magistrale in, eh, che è il titolo Preserving Landscape and Cultural Heritage in Italy A Long History A New Challenge la sua conferenza sarà seguita poi da un, da un dibattito nel quale i discussions saranno Saki Bailey Ishupal Singh Kang e Ruby Till Prego, professor Settis. Thank you so much. I'm uh, 
Um, it's always a pleasure for me to be uh, in Turin, and it's a double pleasure to be here with uh, a group of international students with this uh, slight uh, estrangement effect of, of speaking in English in uh, uh, my own country. I will speak about the uh, relationship of Italy with landscape, and I think that the first thing to say is that Italy has a strange and controversial relationship with uh, its own landscape. Let me start with a slide, this one, showing a quintessentially Italian landscape. Pienza, in Tuscany, the region where I live, a small city founded by Pope Pius II in 1462 and still gloriously emerging from the surrounding landscape on top of a hill in the Val d'Orcia in the province of Siena. Balance of countryside and cityscape is so admirably preserved that in 2004, the entire Val d'Orcia was included among the UNESCO sites. These are the good news. Bad news are that Bad news is that immediately afterwards, the area around Pienza was involved in a real estate project. As you can see on the screen, the Casali di Monticello were advertised as your new home in a UNESCO site. In other words, you can see it here, Casali di Monticello, case da amare. Uh, in other words, the, the UNESCO label that the Val d'Orcia earned for its preservation was immediately exploited for commercial reasons. You can guess from this example where is the point of my talk today. A sharp contrast between a long history of preservation and its decline over the last few years. And this is what happened in Monticello. Now let me start with a few quotations. Quotation number one, from uh, the, a uh, report of uh, Eurispes, a, 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 an Italian agency. According to UNESCO's estimates, Italy has between 60 and 70 percent of the world's cultural assets. Quotation number two, Silvio Berlusconi, then Prime Minister in 2008, 72 percent of Europe's cultural heritage is to be found in Italy in as much as 50% of the world's. Quotation number three, according to a Sicilian minister, 60% of the world's cultural assets are in Italy, and of these, 60% are in, Mag in Magna Grecia, and of these, less than 60% are in Sicily. According to the council responsible for culture in the Regione Toscana, Italy alone has 60% of the world's cultural assets, but 50% of those are concentrated in Tuscany. According to the deputy mayor of Rome, Rome by itself has 30 to 40 percent of the world's cultural assets. Now, if we add all those figures together, it would appear that Italy somehow manages to encompass far more than 100 percent of the cultural heritage worldwide, which could be a uh, sign of, uh, of pride, but it certainly is a, a, an indication of irresponsibility, of shameless irresponsibility. Data which are inconsistent with, with one another, based on nothing, and shamelessly concocted on various occasions. Yet, Italy does have a very significant position because of its cultural heritage, whose central importance, however, is not based on its quantity, but rather on its quality. There are three different reasons for this. First, the time-honored harmony between the city and the wider landscape. Second, the spread of this heritage throughout the country and down to the smallest towns and villages. Third, the continuity in the in situ use of churches, palazzi, statues, paintings, and so forth. As you know, Italian museums only contain a small portion of the country's artistic heritage, which is spread throughout the cities and the countryside. Within this context, which is the product of many centuries of wealth and civilization, the whole, and this is very important to understand, the whole is far more than the sum of its parts. <laughs> 
There is, however, a fourth factor at play, which is no less important, and this is what I'd like to attract your attention to. I mean the Italian model of conservation of cultural heritage. You see in this slide the situation of Italy before unification and after the Congress in Vienna. Long before Italian unification, the Italian states formulated rules and set up public institutions to regulate and engage in this area of activity. Italy, as a country, was the first country to include the preservation of of its landscapes and cultural heritage amongst the founding principles of its constitution. The widespread diffusion of cultural heritage and Italy's tradition of conservation are two sides of the same coin. The rules to safeguard the cultural heritage would not have been introduced without a strong civic sense of duty, triggered by the all-pervasive presence of monuments, churches, historic cities and villages, nor would that presence have been so robust and long-lasting without the guarantees provided by those rules over many centuries? So those two things, rules and, and, uh, and cultural heritage, are two sides of the same medal. Public regulation to protect the country's cultural heritage should not be taken as a given. And in the great majority of countries, they did not exist for a very long time. In the 20th century, particularly, and particularly after World War II, such legislation spread quickly to various countries, for instance, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, using models imported from continental Europe. But the European models, in turn, were uh, developed from the example provided by Italy long before its political unification. Now, the concept of cultural heritage started between Italy and France around the revolution with the idea of patrimoine national in French, which was developed in France between revolution and restoration for the purpose of exploiting that heritage to define the nation as a cultural unit and as a legal entity. At the time, the enormous booty taken by the French armies in Italy and elsewhere and then carried off to Paris was the subject of much passionate debate. It was justified by Winkelmann, strangely enough, by the idea put forward by Winkelmann that arts only thrive where liberty reigns. It followed, therefore, that after the revolution, France was by rights the homeland of art and therefore had the right of, uh, uh, of bringing to Paris all the most important works of art from all over Europe. At, uh, according to the Minister of the Interior, François de Neufchâteau, in, in uh, 1794, quote, it was for neither thing, for neither kings nor popes, the great artists labored in the past, but for the citoyen, given that those ancient craftsmen foresaw the destinies of peoples. You can imagine Tiziano or Raphael working for the French Revolution. And he goes on, divine geniuses, it was for France that you fashioned your masterpieces. Finally then, they have found their proper destination, their home, Paris. And you see in the slide uh, the Laocon and other works of art moving in this save, um, in, in this wonderful save vase, moving from, from, uh, from Rome to Paris. In Italy, the gigantic spoliation felt like desecration and an act of violence, but the harshest and most consistent reaction came from France itself. Catromer de Quincy argued in his Lettre à Miranda that re removing works of art from their original context is a crime against historical memory. He says, a Raphael out of context says nothing. It is not a relic like one piece of the true cross, which by and on itself can be sufficient to convey what he calls the virtues pertaining to the whole. A Raphael alone has no virtues. Katzmer's position was immediately argued for in a petition signed by many artists, including David. The focal point for Katzmer was Rome. He therefore mentioned the rules for conservation introduced by the papacy as early as in the 15th century. Thus, Italian tradition in this respect prompted a vast debate throughout Europe 
on cultural and political matters. There was, there was very similar legislation in all the Italian states before unification. Moreover, they influenced each other. By way of examples, let me now go briefly over some events involving the capital cities of three Italian states, namely Florence, Rome, and Naples. During 30 years, 1725 to 1755. Let me start with Florence. Around 1725, it became clear that the Medici dynasty was driving, was driving to a close and that the European powers would assign the great the Grand Duchy of Tuscany to a new dynasty. It was therefore feared by Florentines that the new Grand Duke might remove the art treasures assembled in Florence by the Medici, and in 1728, a private society was founded to publish the Grand Duchess collections in order to make more widely known their wealth and to contribute to their preservations in situ, in Florence itself, what uh, was published as the Museum Florentinum. One of these project's founders was Neri Corsini, a member of a prominent Florentine family and later a cardinal. And when Tuscany was assigned to Franz Stefan of Lorraine, it was Neri Corsini who thought up the family convention between the uh, Medici, the last of the, of the Medici and the new, uh, the new reigning family of Lorraine in 1737. According to this convention signed in Vienna, the uh, Medici collections were always to remain in Florence, as in fact occurred, and they are now the Uffizi. Let's now move to Rome. In 1728, Cardinal Alessandro Albani, the nephew of Pope Clement XI, sold to King August II of Poland 30 of the best statues in his collection, which are now in Dresden, one of his capitals. The export of antiquities was already officially banned by the papal regulations, but the Cardinal Camerlengo who had, who had the task of implementing the rules was by then Alessandro's brother, Cardinal Annibale Albani, and he did not stop the transaction going ahead. But when Alessandro Albani attempted to sell his second collection to English collectors in 1733, five years later, its export was denied by the same Cardinal Camerlengo, his brother, and his capitals were purchased by the new Pope, Clement XII who founded the Capitoline Museum, the first public museum in Europe, i.e. in the world, in 1734. Moreover, a new papal edict was issued, establishing strict rules against exportation of antiquities. Now, the new pope, Clement XII, was a member of the Corsini family in Florence, and the instigator of his decision was Cardinal Neri Corsini, the same one who had promoted the Museum Florentinum in Florence. Finally, let's take a look at another Italian capital, Naples. The 18-year-old king, Charles of Bourbon, who entered the city to great celebration in 1734, inaugurated a new era in the history of the kingdom, which was now once more independent after centuries of being a Spanish vice royalty. Charles initiated the digs in Herculaneum and Pompeii which produced an enormous quantity of new antiquities. This situation gave rise to Neapolitan legislation to protect the cultural heritage in 1755, which was actually modeled after the legislation implemented in Rome a few years earlier by Pope Clemens XII, Corsini. The new Neapolitan law expressed the king's, quote, profound regret over the past export of antiquities from the kingdom and established new rules to prevent it to happen again in the future. As a consequence, the king ordered a sumptuous publication, Le Antiquità di Ercolano Esposte, and founded the Royal Bourbon Museum, now Museo Nazionale di Napoli. Thus, Naples asserted the idea that works of art should be conserved in their proper context, namely their place of origin, a quintessentially Italian concept, what we 
call in Italian conservazione contestuale, contextual preservation. Indeed, when Charles III became king of Spain in 1759, in his new capacity, he did not issue any provisions to safeguard artifacts there. Had his profound regret over the lack of protection for works of art in Naples vanished in Madrid? No. In both cases, the monarch had not been writing the legislation personally, but expressing through it the civic and juridical tradition of the place in which he was ruler. Such an emulation between Italian states presupposes that they were culturally on the same wavelength and that they shared a common legacy of civic, cultural, and juridical values. And indeed, the history of conservation legislation in the Italian states started long before the country's unification, with, in, and particularly in Rome. In Rome, it was particularly important what happened in the early 19th century when Pope Pius VII enacted extremely well thought out legislation in 1802 and 1819, i.e. short after the, spoli the French spoliation and short after the return of works of art to Rome from Paris. The papal, the papal commissioner in, in Paris was Antonio Canova. In coincidence with this, uh, uh, with this event, the commissioner of antiquities in Rome, Carlo Fea, extensively quoted in his publications the previous papal legislation, going back to Pope Martin V, 1425, Pius II and Leo X, whom you see on the screen, but even considered them to be continuing the principles of Roman imperial law, particularly the concept of publica utilitas, or public benefit. Continuity from Republican and Imperial Rome to Renaissance popes to the present was therefore considered highly significant and fully demonstrable through a long series of carefully studied documents. Very similar laws and regulations were introduced in other Italian states such as Venice, Lucca, Parma, Modena, Milan, and everywhere the individual states through local academies or erudites were starting to catalog works of art first in Venice, 1773, and setting up specific bodies uh, like the Generale Ispettore delle Arti, General Inspector of the Arts in Venice, 1773, or the Regia Custodia delle Antichità di Sicilia, Royal Wardenship of the Antiquities of Sicily, in 1778. So, this is the question. Why did all the Italian states of the time follow the same model and emulate each other in regulating conservation when nothing obliged them to do so? There were no international treaties that obliged them to do so, but they did it, and they emulated one, one another. I believe that the roots of this civic culture and juridical culture are to be found in the spirit and tradition of the Italian cities, which at least from the 12th century on, had been developing a deeply held and highly sophisticated concept of citizenship in which the monuments of individual cities were the basic for civic pride and identity, for a sense of belonging which were closely linked to the very idea of a well-governed community. Let me quote just two of those documents. First, Rome. Rome 1162, a decision of the Commune of Rome concerning Trajan's column, built and sculpted at the beginning of second century AD. This is the decision of the Commune of Rome. In order that the public honor of the city of Rome is preserved, the column shall, sh sh shall never be, be damaged or knocked down but must remain as it is for eternity, intact and unspoiled for as long as the world shall exist. Should anyone inflict or attempt to inflict damage on it, they shall be condemned to death and their assets confiscated by the treasury. You may, you may think that uh, this is too harsh, but 
in the 12th century, there were two such columns in Rome and two such columns in Constantinople. Today, the two columns in Rome are still there. The two columns in Constantinople are destroyed because in Rome there were laws protecting them. In Constantinople there were no laws. Second quote, Siena 1309, Constituto del Comune, the constitution of the Comune di Siena. First page, those who govern the city must, above all, ensure its beauty and ornament, which is essential for the delight and amusement of foreigners, but also for the honor and prosperity of the citizens of Siena themselves. We come across very similar principles in hundreds of documents in, uh, of Italian cities. Beauty, decorum, suitability of, or convenience, public honor, public utilitas, uh, bonum, comune, are the uh, most employed words. Such a general agreement between Italian pre-unification states on how to legislate to protect their cultural heritage constituted what can only be called a common language, very much, the, very much like the use of Italian language by the elites all throughout Italy, especially after Dante. With an identical understanding of the civic function of a city's beauty and ornamentation and the same desire to hand down the values of one generation to the next, even through specially constituted public offices. For instance, we find the Officiali dell'Ornato, officers of ornamentation, with the same name in Siena and in Verona. Strange, strangely enough, but it's quite the same thing. In Siena from 1403, the legal foundation of these regulations was the notion of public, of public benefit or publica utilitas derived from classical Roman law. A document produced by Pope Gregory XIII in 1574 expressly asserts that the public good, publica utilitas, has absolute priority over private interests in matter concerning building works in Rome and in the Papal States. The Papal Edict issued in 1733 by Clement XII, as I mentioned, referred back to this principle when securing the continued presence of antiquities in Rome and founding the Capitoline Museum. The principle of public benefit of cultural heritage is a marked expression of continuity in Italian history. However, when the Italian kingdom was established in 1859-1860 in, in after Italian unification with the addition of Rome in 1870, as you know, it would take nearly half a century for a unified law on cultural conservation to be introduced. So why? It seems in contradiction with what I just said. One of the reasons for such a, a delay must be specifically mentioned in this city. The state that was the driving force behind the unification of Italy was the Kingdom of Sardinia, whose capital was Turin, which included Piedmont, Liguria, and Savoy. And it was precisely in this state that the tradition of conservation had been much weaker than in all the rest of Italy. Indeed, the Statuto Albertino, the constitution granted by King Cha Carlo Alberto in 1848, granted the absolute inviolability of private property, precisely the opposite of the legislation passed by the Pope and the King of Naples, where public utilities was granted absolute priority over private interests. Such a sharp difference between contrasting tradition coming from different parts of a newly unified Italy gave rise to bitter conflicts which dragged on in the national parliament for decades, even as, Italy, as, as, as Italy's capital was moved from Turin to Florence, and finally from Florence to Rome. An in, in initial but very weak law was achieved only in 1902 and was replaced in 1909 by a much improved one, which is still with, with various transformation the base of our legislation in this respect. In 1907 and 1908, there was a significant campaign to mobilize public opinion, and this eventually led to the law of 1909, where, uh, which was uh, the continuation of the tradition of Rome and Naples, not of those of the Kingdom of Sardinia, not of those of Turin, but it, it took 50 years. <laughs> 
the uh, um, law of 1909 called Legge Rava, after the name of the Minister of Education at that time, explicitly established the primacy of public interest of private property for all the buildings and movable that are and movables that are of historical, archaeological, ethnological, or artistic interest and prohibited their sale when in public ownership, giving the Ministry of Education a supervisory role. Items that were private property were subject to complete protection when they were of significant interest, important, importante interesse, with a regulation requirement called vincolo or notifica. As implied by the notifica, their export was banned, and if their owners wanted to sell them within Italy, the state was granted the full right of preemption. The original draft legislation contained other principles which were approved by the Chamber of Deputies but not by the Senate, and those included popular action, azione popolare, a direct reference to actio popularis in Roman law. This would have given every citizen the right as the, um, as the minister said, to ensure, quote, to ensure the application of the rights belonging to the state and to demand that the conservation laws be observed in defense of the public good. The purpose was to create a well-established public opinion clearly aimed at assisting the state in the conservation of the artistic heritage. The principle was not approved by the Senate. In the text, of the law approved by the Chamber, the law also contained the protection of landscape, which was deleted by the Senate, many of whose members represented the interests of the aristocracy and large estate owners. The Senate at the time in Italy was appointed by the King, not elected by the people. But there was by this time considerable debate in Italy about the protection of the countryside under the influence of other experiences, particularly uh, the American ones. During the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, 1901-1909, there was the biggest campaign ever for the protection of natural environment, leading to the creation of six national parks, 18 national monuments, and so forth, a system which is still in place. Roosevelt was inspired by the principle formulated by Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the United States Forestry Service. Quote, conservation means the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. I think it's a beautiful definition. President Roosevelt used the following words to comment on it. The greatest good for the greatest number applies to the number within the womb of time, I'm quoting, compared to which those now alive form but an insignificant fraction. Our duty to the whole, including the unborn generations, bids us restrain an unprincipled present-day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations. The movement from the, for the conservation of wildlife and the larger movement for the conservation of all our natural resources are essentially democratic in spirit, purpose, and method." End quote. One of the pioneers of American conservation is this gentleman on the screen, George Perkins Marsh, the first American ambassador to Italy who held that office for 20 years, from 1861, moving from various capitals, Turin, Florence, and Rome. He died in, Flore he, he died in Rome and, 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 uh, and his tomb is in Florence. While he was in Italy, he wrote a famous, a, a then famous book, Men in Nature, uh, 1864, uh, which he himself translated into Italian, which was very influential in Italy too. Protection of natural environment as a moral obligation towards future generations and its close identification with national identity were not only characteristics of American conservationism, but also of similar movements in Europe. In the, the United Kingdom, John Ruskin was particularly effective in this context. According to him, the landscape has to be protected as it is a source of intense ethical and aesthetical experiences, not just for an individual, but also for citizens as a collectivity. Landscape reflects and determines the moral order, according to Ruskin, and is therefore a key place in social responsibility. 
It is where social and political demands are obliged to contend with values of nature, beauty, and memory. Moreover, if they fail to take the beauty of nature into account, they also betray their own values. Ruskin's theories were propagated in France by Robert de la Cisran in a book, Ruskin et la religion de la beauté, which was a great success also in Italy. Hence, the Italian conservationist slogan, often attributed to Ruskin, but actually in the Cisran book, Il paesaggio e il volto amato della patria. Landscape is the beloved face of the fatherland. But the Italian landscape is not just nature. It has been molded over the centuries by an intense human contribution. It is a highly historicized landscape, frequently depicted by Italian and foreign writers, poets, painters. In turn, the real physical landscape has been modeled over time on poems, pictures, and frescoes. Thus, the naturalistic inspiration was immediately accompanied in Italy by a different and complementary sensitivity that associated the landscape with works, of, with works of art and exploited a conceptual and descriptive category, that of veduta, or view, or vista. This word can be applied to both a painting and a perspective, let's say, from a window, from a city window through the landscape or from the landscape to the city. According to Goethe, in his Italian journey, architecture in the Italian landscape is a second nature aimed at the public benefit. Although it was more recent, the protection here a typical Italian veduta. Although it was more recent, the protection of landscape in Italy grew out of the same ethical, juridical, civic, and political fabric that uh, had uh, given rise to the protection of its artistic heritage. Industrialization at a slower pace than in Northern Europe brought increasing dangers for the Italian countryside, and the conservationist movement started to grow. Associations were formed, and public opinion began to shift, leading in 1905 to an ad hoc regulation to protect a very small, though important, portion of landscape, the Pinehood near Ravenna. The first comprehensive legislation, though, was only fostered in 1920 by the then Minister of Education, Benedetto Croce. In his report to the Senate, Croce recalled the American and European presidents and referred to what were and still remain the two kernels of the problem. First, relationship between nature and culture, or city and countryside. Second, the balance between public interest and private property. According to Croce, quote, a powerful moral and artistic interest legitimizes state intervention, given that the landscape is no less than a material and visible representation of the nation. And you may recognize here the Ruskinian imprint, and actually Croce quotes from Ruskin two, line, two, two lines after this sentence. The measures taken to protect it are, it's true, says Croce, a constraint upon the rights of private property. But this was what in legal terms is called a, serv a servitus or a servitude, a burden imposed by law in limiting the rights of private owners in the interest of the public benefit. According to Croce, quote, the disfigurement of a monument or the violation of a beautiful landscape, both the standard for everyone's enjoyment would be equally inadmissible. Here, as you can see, uh, we may witness the persistent vitality of the theme of pub publica utilitas or public benefit. During the debate in the chamber, there was even mention of the servitus prospectus, servitus of, servitude of view provided for under Roman law, particularly for Constantinople, where the views were protected by law. The Croce law was passed in 1922, a few months before the advent of fascism. For 17 years, Mussolini's regime did nothing to change laws about conservation of cultural, artistic, and natural heritage. But in 1939, the minister Giuseppe Bottai set about a systematic reform, introducing two parallel laws, one for landscape and one for uh, for, uh, for, for public, uh, for, for, for uh, art, uh, artistic heritage and cultural heritage. They were, in fact, a new 
version of the Legge Rava of 1909 and Legge Croce of 1920-1922. They had nothing specifically fascist in them. For Bottai, in 1939, the servitù di pubblico godimento, the right to public enjoyment, was the guiding principle, the, the guiding principle as for Croce. While the laws were being drafted, Bottai relied upon the best of Italian intelligentsia, and they mentioned among the art historians Roberto Longhi and Giulio Carlo Argan, and the great jurist Santi Romano. The two laws of 1939 were conceived as an interrelated whole, implicitly affirming that the protection of landscape and the protection of the historical uh, heritage are two sides of the same coin, a conclusion that wholly reflected Italy's centuries-long civic and juridical tradition. Such a tradition can perfectly be exemplified by a Ordine del Real Patrimonio di Sicilia, a decree of the vice uh, of the Viceroy of, of Sicily in 1745, whereby two different areas were identified as needing special conservation and care, an archaeological site, Taormina, and a naturalistic one, the forest near the Etna. And you see them both in the slide. The decree was issued by the Viceroy of Sicily, appointed in this capacity by King Charles of Bourbon, whom I mentioned, and who was the Viceroy? A Florentine prince, Bartolomeo Corsini, the brother of Cardinal Neri Corsini, who signed in Vienna the uh, convention between Medici, Medici and Lorraine family and nephew of the Pope who founded the Capitoline Museum. So you see the Italian elites with the same family acting in several places in the same direction. The long durée continuity I'm insisting on can be shown by another quick observation. Bottai's two laws were passed in June 1939 by a fascist government. Nevertheless, they faithfully reflected the spirit of pre-fascist Italy as embodied in the Rava and Croce laws. There is more. Bottai's laws were so lacking in specifically fascist content that following the war and the ruinous fall of fascism, the Italian Republic that came out of anti-fascismo and resistenza, placed the inspiring concept of those laws amongst the foundation, the founding principles of the state. As Sabino Cassese, a judge of the Constitutional Court, uh, wrote, the uh, Article 9 of our Constitution is the constitutionalization of the Bataille laws. Article 9 of the Constitution states, La Repubblica promuove lo sviluppo della cultura e la ricerca scientifica e tecnica, tutela il paesaggio e il patrimonio storico e artistico della nazione. The Republic shall promote development of culture and scientific and technical research. It shall protect the landscape and the nation's historical and artistic heritage. The Constituente or Constituent Assembly arrived at this formulation after a long debate and 11 different proposed texts. Members of all parties contributed to the final wording, particularly the communist Concetto Marchesi, a professor of Latin from Sicily who had been rector at the University of Padua, and a very young Christian Democrat, member of parliament, later to be prime minister, very famous, Aldo Moro. In its final formulation, this article is one of the few uh, founding principles of the state and must be read together with the other principles. Article 9 embodies a centuries-long process whose two main factors are the primacy of public interest of private property and the close linkage between protection of cultural heritage and protection of landscape. The perfect continuity between the conservationist laws of Italy's liberal government, the two laws passed by Mussolini's regime, and finally Article 9 of the Constitution will only come as a surprise to those who think in terms of labels and affiliations and fail to enter into the complexities of the history of ideas. What might be even more surprising to them is the evident continuity between conservationist legislation of the Italian states of the ancien regime, for instance, Rome or Naples, and the heritage and conservation culture that spread around Europe after the French, after the French Revolution. The latter was not a restoration of previous laws, but a radical rethinking of the languages and rules of the ancien regime 
in the light of new guiding principles such as the concepts of nation, of popular sovereignty, and of citizenship, concepts that the events of the French Revolution changed forever while giving new meaning to the very notion of common good or publica utilitas, and encapsulating it, among other things, also in historical monuments. Such a process can be eloquently evidenced by a brief quotation from, from Hegel's outlines of the philosophy of law, 1821. Quote, public monuments and landscape are national property, which, to be more precise, means that just as with works of art in general, when they are put to use, public monuments fulfill living and autonomous ends for as long as they are endowed with soul of memory and honor. Once they are abandoned by the soul of memory and honor, however, they become in this sense private, anonymous, incidental possessions, as far as the nation is concerned, as with the Greek and Egyptian works of art in Turkey. And he means certainly uh, this is an allusion to the Elgin marbles being sold by, 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 uh, by Turkish officers to Lord Elgin. In this very dense text by Hegel, we can perceive the same concept of patrimoine national whose formulation we had seen in Quatre Mer. In Hegel's view, the two convergent poles of memory and honor with their astonishing ethical force are the entitlement for the citizenry but presuppose the institutional form of the modern post-revolutionary state. Therefore, they require complete harmony between ethics and politics, a careful balance between preserving historical memory and planning a future for generations to come. If the soul of memory and honor deserts life and history, says Hegel, a radical loss of meaning inevitably ensues. This, according to Hegel, is what had, had happened in the Ottoman Empire. We have briefly retraced the journey of Italy's conservationist culture from the Italian communes of the Middle Ages, here seen on the screen, through the legislation of pre-unification states and then those of unified Italy, arriving ultimately at our constitution. Such a process is unique in its continuity and coherence. It is by no means typical for the principle of conservation to be enshrined in the constitutional charter. Article 9 of Italian Constitution had just two precedents, one, the constitution of the Weimar Republic in Germany in 1919, and that of the Spanish Republic in 1931. But uh, in, in neither case, uh, this principle was among the general principles. Today, only few states have, have given this principle constitutional status. So far, I have told the story of a constant growth in crescendo from a few regulations in particular cities to the constitution of a modern state, and they could continue up to the present, to the present laws, the Codice dei Beni Culturali e del Paesaggio, 2004, amended until 2008. But I feel unfortunately obliged to end on a very different tone and to declare with no, in no uncertain terms that this complex system of conservation, probably still today the best worldwide on paper, doesn't work. A few statistics can help us to understand what is happening in Italy today. The devastation of landscape has become dramatic. In 15 years, from 1990 to, 20, to 2005, 17% of the Italian countryside has been covered by new buildings. On average, over 250 million cubic meters of building is contracted every year. Finally, Italy's growth in built-up areas is almost 40 times greater than its very modest demographic growth. So Italy has the smallest demographic growth of Europe and the largest, the highest soil consumption of Europe. The harmonious relationship between the Italian cities and their countryside established over many centuries, giving way to an uncontrolled urban sprawl, which is now home to a large amount of the population. The ancient forma urbis is exploding, and it's still and, and its ill-defined expansion is not only blurring its boundaries, but also depriving its center of its very shape and function. 
in the new landscape, the new Italian landscape, which is mostly a suburban landscape. The remaining space between built-up areas ceases to be a filter and has come to resemble a kind of no man's land, while the land in the countryside, now covered with cement, loses forever the ecological functions it once fulfilled. <clears throat> An exceptionally fragile ground and environment subject to landslides, flooding, earthquakes, is increasingly left to itself. And while the government embarks upon enormous public works, such as the bridge over the Strait of Messina, built, not built, and very costly, even if not built, almost nothing is done for the areas at greatest risk. Although the conservation the conservation is laws remain in force and are indeed constantly improved on, on paper, derogation, exceptions, amnesties, in Italian condoni, for the infringement of building regulations are continuously enacted. These condoni allow those who have destroyed part of the landscape to free themselves from criminal charges by paying a very small fine. As these amnesties are brought in on a regular basis, Everyone knows they can break the law with impunity by waiting a few years to regularize their illegal building work through payment of a fine. And the uh, carelessness with which new buildings are built brings to disasters such as those in L'Aquila. At the same time, conservation of the cultural heritage is undergoing a deep crisis caused by lack of human and financial resources. For many years, there has been no more recruitment of new staff almost no turnover, and those employed by the superintendents they now have an average of almost 60 years. This means that uh, the whole system doesn't work. In 2008, Berlusconi's government cut funding to the Ministry of Cultural Assets by about one and a half billion euros, which made all kinds of action almost impossible. That's why, that's why Pompeii is falling down, Domus Aurea in Rome is falling down, and so forth. Facing with this lack of resources, Increasing currency was given to the idea of privatizing the cultural heritage according to a non-existent uh, America model, which is not known by, the Italian, by most Italian politicians. In this, um, in this set, uh, a, uh, in such a, a quick outline of the current crisis of Italian conservation, I must include a brief, a brief reference to a third factor. The steady destruction of the Italian landscape of cultural heritage we are experiencing does definitely not arise from lack of, of legislation, but from excess of legislation. Sort of accanimento therapeutico, I would say in Italian. How can we say in English? Futile medical, medical um, treatment. This is in part due to the fact that, th that uh, the laws have been often been introduced inconsistently, piling one on top of the other, creating a tangle of jurisdictional conflicts, for instance, between the laws of, uh, of Italy and those of the regions, of the individual regions. On this point, let me only refer to the most serious case, the terminological chaos revolving around three keywords, landscape, paesaggio, Territory, territorio, environment, ambiente. Landscape <laughs> must be protected by the Italian state, <coughs> and in particular the Ministry of Cultural Assets, Ministero dei Beni Culturali. But territory, states Article uh, 117 of the Constitution, must be regulated and planned not by the central government, but by the regions and local council. Environment comes under various jurisdictions, and in every case, and in any case, under a different ministry, not cultural assets, but environment. This is particularly a particularly striking example of what we may call a divorce between Italian politicians and the common sense of Italian citizens. So we have a, a majority and the minority of 60 million Italians who are governed by a majority of 1,000 members of the parliament. This is not some abstract dispute, the one I mentioned. If, for example, a decision is to be taken of whether or not to destroy a pine hood like this, who is supposed to take this, that decision and issue the relevant permits, state, 
region, or local council? The answer is not simple. If we consider this area to be landscape, the jurisdiction of it is due to the state. If we label it as territory, then the jurisdiction moves to the region that in its turn can move it to the local council. But if it is characterized as environment, it falls under mixed competence, state, regions, and so forth. The legislation is so complex, especially after the constitutional reform of 2001, very bad in my view, that every year several demarcation disputes over jurisdiction are taken to the constitutional court. And uh, according to Gustavo Zagrebeski, who is no longer here, no, uh, in, uh, who was uh, president of the Constitutional Court, more than 50% of uh, the work the Constitutional Court is, is doing is to act after and to decide uh, conflicts between state and regions after the Constitutional Reform of 2001. But uh, let me put a different question, a more fundamental question. Can there be a territory without landscape and an environment? Can there be a landscape without territory and an environment? Can there be an environment without territory and a landscape? If we, it, it is therefore both very much needed, but extremely difficult, especially today, to rewrite the whole system so that the three Italy's of landscape, territory, and environment can become a single entity once more, as they are in fact. Start again, not from the laws, and from the conflicts of interests of different politicians, but from the object itself that needs to be protected. Every day, events that I cannot offer for you here demonstrate the gradual, perhaps irreversible deterioration of Italy's very long conservational, conservationist tradition and of its ethical and juridical civilization, which uh, I try to summarize. We need, therefore, to ask ourselves whether the current situation is hopeless or whether there are still initiatives we could attempt. My response will be very brief. As an individual, one is a citizen, not as a politician, uh, and um, my response is to take its, its starting point two very simple assessments. First, no political party currently represented in the parliament, without a single exception, has given this question any prominence in recent times. Second, S the citizens are increasingly uh, interested in this, uh, in this problem. Something like 30,000 public associations, big and small, have been set up in Italy for protection of landscape and cultural heritage over the last five or six years. There are mostly local um, associations and movements. Another expression of the Italian particularism, campanilismo, as we say which at the moment appears just to be adding to the country's various centrifugal forces, but I think it might also contain some positive qualities and manage to reconnect citizenry to an ancient culture of our cities much better than the official political forces will be ever able to do. This, in my view, could certainly regenerate forms of popular action, actio popularis, like those that were theorized by at the time of the law in 1909 for the environment. But this is certainly not enough. We badly need more education in Italy. We certainly need, we badly need more consciousness, more um, information worldwide and uh, an, an informed opinion in Europe, in America, in Japan, and, and wherever else about, about the dangers of the Italian landscape. A shift in public opinion of the kind that I'm hoping for should be based on correct and reliable information. I think we should think of, of, of this term in terms of the rights of future generation, as of, uh, from the wonderful quotation from Theodore Roosevelt's uh, speech, and on this basis we should build or rebuild a credible institutional and, le and legislative framework. That's why I'm, I'm glad that you've been listening to me with uh, such intense attention because I think that a well-informed public opinion, not only by Italians, but worldwide, should help us understanding the values of our conservationist culture, the values of our landscape, and help to protect it for the future generations. Thank you very much indeed.
Grazie, professor Settis, di questa splendida lezione. We thank you for your marvelous lesson. Now, uh, adesso abbiamo la, il primo intervento del dottor Ishu Pai Sinken. The first, uh, the first discussion is the Dr. Ishupal Singh Kang. So on. Uh, uh, A very good morning to all of you. I would like to contribute to the discussion by making a comparison between India and Italy with regards to preservation of cultural heritage and would like to stress the importance of relationship between people and their culture which gives the cultural heritage its real value for the society. The richness and diversity of cultural heritage is one of the stronger points of similarities between India and Italy. Just like Italy, India boasts of a long cultural history going back to several centuries. And this richness and diversity of cultural heritage is not only reflected in now world-renowned monuments like the Taj Mahal or the Sanchi Stupas, but also in countless local historical temples, mosques, ruins of ancient cities, the Indian villages, and their way of life, which adorns the Indian landscape. However, the way cultural heritage has been protected in Italy is in stark contrast to the Indian situation. As Professor Sethis mentioned, one of the primary reasons that Italian cultural heritage is one of the best protected in the world is the presence of a long legal tradition prioritizing the protection of cultural heritage. And this uh, long tradition can be traced back to the rules and norms which were developed in Italian medieval cities. We can find similarity to, uh, similarities to this in Indian history as well. For example, uh, the House of Mewar, who are the rulers of the Mewar Kingdom, the, the, the region in state of Rajasthan from where I am, ruled the kingdom on the basis of idea of custodianship. And the kings of Mewar dynasty did not consider themselves as the sovereign ruler of the people, but they just considered themselves as the custodian or the agent of their local deity, uh, Sri Eklingji. And it is said that a great sage of that time, Harit Rishi, instructed the first king of the dynasty to follow this custodianship model and to adhere to the three cardinal principles, one of which was preservation and maintenance of ancient Vedic culture. And this can be very well observed in Mewar today also, that despite of being under constant invasions and attacks, it has ma managed to maintain and enrich the cultural landscape over the centuries. And despite this, we find a complete lack of a legal tradition in India for protecting the cultural heritage. And the reason for this is that at the time when in Italy, the Italian states were recognizing the importance, being attached, uh, importance of protecting cultural heritage, uh, the, uh, India was already under the colonial, colonial rule of the British Empire. And though under the colonial rule, first antiquarian laws for India were established as early as 1810, and many important discoveries and excavations were done, promotion and protection of cultural heritage was not a priority for the British imperialistic designs. And moreover, while in Italy, the importance was being attached to the protection of cultural heritage in situ, India was experiencing an age of plunder which resulted in export of a lot of cultural artifacts as well as, uh, gradual, uh, as, well as relative neglect and gradual deterioration of, uh, of its cultural heritage. And in spite of uh, suffering for almost two centuries of uh, this cultural plunder and lack of a strong legal tradition during that period, the Indian society in general can still be considered to be closely connected to its cultural roots. 
And in this vacuum of legal tradition, I consider the role of customs and traditions very important in preserving the Indian cultural heritage. The customs and traditions reflect the important relationship between people and culture, which is characteristic of Indian way of life. There are many examples for this. For instance, there are several ancient temples in India which are not on any government list of protected monuments, but still have survived and are maintained solely on donations and contribution received from local people. Similarly, the Theva art, which is a centuries old art of jewelry making in Rajasthan, is still carried on as a traditional occupation and used uh, in social function like marriages. This demonstrates that cultural heritage is not a dead thing from the past, but it is a continuous process that how the past is mirrored and redefined in the present. And the relevance of cultural heritage is defined by the strong relationship and attachment which a society has towards its cultural history. So in the Western legal sense, though there were no effective legal protection of cultural heritage in India, these customary forms of laws and norms prove to be enduring and effective modes of protection of cultural heritage. And it can be said that there is similarity between India and Italy in the sense that the Italian model for protection of cultural heritage also developed from customs and traditions rules. And I completely agree with Professor Sethis that the traditional model of protection of cultural heritage has been so effective as it has always treated cultural heritage first as a whole, inextricably linked to the concept of cultural heritage, uh, in, in inextricably linked to the uh, concept of territory and having its own intrinsic value. However, what seems to be missing in the picture is the concept of cultural heritage as a continuous process as opposed to a static structure. The intrinsic value of cultural objects or monument is in fact determined by the relationship and affinity which the people have toward them. And I would now like to conclude by saying that the challenges faced in Italy with regard to protection of cultural heritage might also be seen in a different perspective. As a problem of lack of defining relationship between the people and culture, which has enabled cultural objects and landscape being valued only as economic assets. Thank you. Abbiamo la seconda discussant, la professoressa Saki Bailey. Ok, thank you. So, thank you professor Settis for your thought provoking presentation. I thought that in addition to providing a very rich view of the Italian law and history on cultural heritage protection, I think your discourse opened up many interesting questions about the nature of cultural heritage, not only as a thing, but something as beyond the object itself, as Mr. Kang is suggesting, a kind of process, not only with the end of preserving the things themselves, but cultural heritage as a means by which artistic and historical works can have value in society in this living Hegelian sense that you brought out today. Today, what is the renewed relevance of cultural heritage? I think this is, this is the question that you're bringing out. Um, so what makes an object of cultural heritage continuously relevant? I'm going to start with a very simple premise that the value of an object, and hence the necessity for its preservation and maintenance, is determined by the system from which we view that object. So if that system is capitalism, the relevance of a monument or work of art is understood in economic terms as a commodity with a certain economic value. And hence, though, within this system, those objects with the highest economic value merit more preservation. However, if we instead view that very same object from the point of view of its cultural heritage value, the object is evaluated with a very different criteria. And the big open question, which I think your discourse provokes, is what is the criteria that determines the value of cultural heritage? 
Is the criteria one of scientific value? Because as you demonstrate, cultural heritage is valuable because historians can study those objects and reveal their context in a nation's history. Or is the criteria one of political value? Because as you suggest, this object informs us about the historical nature of our citizenship. This uh, beautiful slide that you showed up of the Buon Governo in Siena, right? This concept of citizenship. Um, and understanding our renewed sense of what citizenship means in the past and what it could mean today must, might compel us to political action. Or perhaps is the value cultural? And in that case, what does culture really mean in this context? And probably as we go through these different criteria and dimensions of value, we understand that all of them, or possibly more, are relevant uh, to understanding the value of this object. As we know, in defining something as characterized by an infinite amount of values, it often renders the object ambiguous, often renders the concept ambiguous, and diluting it in all spheres, scientific, pol political, and cultural. And we're often left to revert to a kind of reductionist, under, reductionist understanding of the value of the object, which is usually its economic value, which can be measured precisely to the euro. So for example, the unclear function of museums today, which is the kind of typical way in which we celebrate works of art in the West, seems to me quite clearly symptomatic of this illness of ambiguity. The reason why the value of museums is unclear is because the value of those objects contained within are unclear, namely for the reason that the system of relevance to those objects, scientific, political, or cultural, is unclear. As Mr. Kang is pointing out, the case of museums is very different from the way that cultural heritage is treated in countries like India. It's very different from the case of the necklace, uh, the necklaces in Rajasthan. Uh, in Mr. Kang's example, there is a very precise cultural and societal value placed on the production of these necklaces, uh, which is deeply connected and embedded to uh, cultural and societal institutions, specifically that of marriage. So in this context, cultural heritage has a precise value which is non-economic and derived from the nature of cultural heritage as a lived process by which the interaction between people and the objects is an ongoing value-producing activity within the society. However, on the other hand, the museum concept of cultural heritage fails to sustain itself, both in economic and cultural and uh, political terms, precisely because it has failed to treat those objects contained within as something other than dead relics of the past, as opposed to culturally relevant artifacts for the present. So to be fair, Professor Settis, you don't specify today the exact value of cultural heritage that you have in mind. However, it's easy to see from your latest book, Azione Populare. So I'm going to discuss a little bit of this. One, one second, I take some water. I thought in this book you captured the relationship between the goods of cultural heritage and this process of value production in this dichotomy that you present between beni comuni e bene comune, okay? These are fundamentally two different ideas of cultural heritage as goods. In this sense, cultural heritage is imbued with two layers of meaning. One, as beni comuni, the goods themselves and the process by which communities produce those goods and derive their livelihood. This is the version exemplified by the community studied by Eleanor Ostrom, for example, local people engaging in informal and formal law production for the regulation and management of their resources. This is the example of man working the land, raising the animals on the pastures, utilizing the earth for himself, and according to Ostrom, also for his community. But if we stay only with this idea of beni comuni, we would have an undesir undesirable scenario where communities capable of claiming water, culture, and other universal goods could reserve them within small contractual communities for themselves and potentially depriving their fellow citizens of universal access. And this is why, as Professor Setis points out in this book, there is a need for a second layer 
of value, which goes beyond the functionality of the goods, that of bene comune, the idea that certain goods, like those of cultural heritage, are connected to the rights of citizenship. And by developing this second idea of bene comune, Professor Setis is connecting the historical movement for bene comuni, as explained, as rooted in the imperial Roman law, to a participatory process, that of bene comune, where citizens enter into an organic and lived relationship with their heritage and their constitution. According to Setis, this understanding respects the continuum in the Italian legal tradition between beni pubblici and beni comuni, both of which their core function is to ensure the public interest. By linking these two concepts together, Setis, I think, is bringing together the relevance of local action in the management and defense of beni comuni with the larger concept of bene comune as a democratic and constitutional process. Now, I find this model, what I'm going to label the constitutional commons, which is many ways very similar to what is being proposed by Stefano Rodotà, inspiring in the sense that it manages to avoid the slippery slope into tribalism and anarchy, while at the same time providing an alternative to the state as market. However, this said, the model proposed by Setis, I think, has some flaws, which I would like to bring out here, some critiques. One flaw, I think, is structural and internal to this constitutional process, and I think the second is more practical, and more, it's more my curiosity about the mechanisms by which we can achieve this kind of a model. To so, so to start with the more structural argument, I think the model overlooks the problematic relationship between citizens and the state, and the state and the market. As Ugo Mattei is pointing out in his book, Beni Comuni, the state is an enemy of the commons, okay? You respond, Professor said, to this accusation in this book by pointing to the necessity of reviving the state and constitution and retrieving this idea, which you quote Calamandre, of the state as community. However, I'm not convinced that this is enough to overcome the point which Professor Mattei is making, which is that the state has become an enemy of the people, not just because the national governors are disrespecting the constitution, though this is clearly true, but rather that they do so as a result of the current hegemonic logic of neoliberalism. And again, and again going back to the issue that the value of an object is determined by the system that it is subject to let us superficially consider the value of the Italian constitution within a system of neoliberal economics. According to neoliberalism, the only role of the government is to facilitate competition in the market, to ensure optimal market conditions. We can understand immediately why this undermines and challenges the idea that the primary role of the government is in fact to guarantee the provisions of the constitution. So if we want to retain those protections, we must actually remove the subjugation of the Constitution from this neoliberal framework. How is this to be accomplished, however, when national citizens have no constituent relationship to the European governance which mandates the subjugation? This seems like a point to me which in your model of constitutionalism and citizenship doesn't seem sufficiently addressed. The other question I have is a more practical one, and again, it's more an open question out of my own curiosity. Uh, I'm curious about your reliance on constitutional law and public law mechanisms to achieve and invoke popular actions on behalf of the commons. Um, as you know, uh, there are also not only defensive forms of litigation, but also the construction of new legal institutions, which is taking place, for example, here in Italy, as we know, in the case of water in Naples. And also, I wanted to point out and ask a question, which is what you think about also the activation and use of private law mechanisms like the foundation, for example, in the case of the Teatro Valle. I know from another example that you gave, you point out the, ver the, mal the, the, the poor management which took place here in Turin as a result of the Egyptian museum being turned into a foundation. And I think that possibly the reason why it is linked to the lack of representation of the public, but how, however, this may not be a flaw uh, integral to the, the, the constitution of the foundation, of the form of the foundation, but rather that in this particular case, possibly uh, 
they failed to place more public representatives. However, the foundation may allow that, as in the case of the Teatro Valle. Um, so again, I think the link between the management and participation in resources as linked to this value of citizenship is a powerful way in which to both encourage local activism and direct democracy, while at the same time respecting the values of universal citizenship, universal rights of citizens to access resources. However, I'm a little bit concerned about the optimism in overcoming neoliberal policy through constitutionalism, and I'm very curious about the real mechanisms you have in mind to implement this model. Thank you. Abbiamo il terzo discussant che è il dottor Ruby Till. The first the last discussant. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, I would like to pick up on two main points that I think are left as quite open questions by Professor Settis' presentation. First, on the issue of costs, considering the potential economic value of cultural heritage and the options of public and private funding given the current situation of austerity. And secondly, on the issue of defining culture and cultural heritage and the valuable insight and analysis that can be offered by using the concept of commons. Although perhaps unpopular, I think in our modern context, an added economic discussion can really contribute to the problems outlined by Professor Settis. I would like to pose the question of why governments should spend public money on cultural heritage monuments and museums. I think that whether we criticize the commodification of culture or not, which I will discuss, investing in this sector of the economy makes clear, undeniable sense. A study into the performance of the cultural sector in recent years following the economic crisis, which was done by King's College in London, excellently demonstrates this. The hypothesis put forward, I think unsurprisingly, expected that the cultural sector would suffer a huge blow and resulting at least partial collapse following the austerity measures being pursued all over the continent. Culture suffered an even greater blow than other areas of spending, because in such a time of crisis, it's given much less priority, much less importance than other areas like health or education. So it suffered a disproportionate fall in public funding. However, the facts show that this collapse has not happened. The cultural sector has relatively outperformed other areas of the economy and continues to be an invaluable source of employment and wealth creation, particularly in large historic cities such as Rome or, or London. Um, and London is one of an ex the exceptional cases where um, the, the cultural economy actually is the fourth, er the fourth largest sector of employment in London. But the ec economic benefits of culture, heritage and history are evident not only in employment, but in tourism, increased house prices, lifestyle benefits that can attract, mo attract mobile investors, again, particularly in these large global cities, among many other effects. So I think it's clear that government spending on culture and cultural heritage management, preservation, promotion, and more, brings huge economic benefits, both direct through employment and numerous indirect knock-on effects. But as we have seen, the current economic crises have resulted in an almost continent-wide policy of austerity. And without questioning the efficacy of this policy more broadly, these cuts to public funding across the whole economy pose a new question. Would selling or lending monuments and museums to private owners who may be willing to take care of them be a good solution, essentially privatization? The austerity measures in Italy today are to a large extent dictated by the European Union, as mentioned by Ms. Bailey. And so Italy arguably has very little scope to increase its public funding in culture. So the possibility of privatization of cultural heritage could offer a real solution in the absence of public funding. And Professor Settis, in, you, you mentioned um, house building earlier ruining the landscape, we really get the impression that you don't favor privatization and you really condemn the commodification of, of culture and landscape. Um, and I agree there are problems with privatizing goods and activities involved in culture and cultural heritage, stemming from um, the valuable knock-on effects I mentioned earlier, which are actually 
it may, makes it very difficult to capture um, this, this value added and appropriate it for profit. So in practice, private cultural attractions often do not yield a profit. Professor Settis, previously you've given the example of the Getty Museum and it, it shows that the losses really can be huge in terms of revenue from the cultural site itself. Um, and, the, sorry, um, forcing, forcing the Getty Museum specifically to rely on huge capital investment and not being able to make a profit from its car parks, its shops. But there is a diff a, an important difference between the Getty Museum and most historical attractions in Italy, cultural attractions, admission fees. The Getty Museum is free to enter, and so the revenues are only from parking shops, but most museums and landmarks in Italy do charge an entrance fee. And so the potential for income is greater, and privately owned cultural heritage could, in theory, make a profit. And this is, as I've said, often seen as a very unpopular suggestion, but its success, I think, relies on a balance between the private freedom and the necessary laws and, and boundaries governing the scope for change afforded to these investors. Professor Settis has shown us how Italy's laws protecting cultural heritage have facilitated the amassing of a large public patrimony over the centuries, as well as positing that these laws are being attacked and weakened, even rendered inoperative, by the exploitative capitalist desires of private guardians who value such goods or landmarks simply as commodities and the abundance of complex legislation. However, I do think the Italian government can limit the private rights of such an investor, imposing boundaries to create the result of both private profit and cultural preservation, despite the divergent interests in these results. If it's true in the Italian case that privatization and the abundance of legislation has to some extent rendered these preservation laws inoperative, I'd like to pose the question of whether this is actually much more of a political problem in the institutions that seek to govern and impose such boundaries. And I, I, just, I don't think that this is a reason to simply condemn the idea of, of privatization in the cultural sector. And as mentioned by Ms. Bailey, there are different legal tools available today in terms of privatization, such as the foundation, as previously discussed um, by Professor Settis in, in Copenhagen, with regard to the Egyptian Museum here in Turin. And perhaps these legal tools can attempt to converge these public and private interests. An obvious option seemed to be offered by you, Professor Settis, in your critique of the particular private foundation of the Egyptian Museum a more proportional representation on the board based upon the different funding streams and the public objective of preservation as the most, most important factor. But on the subject of private versus public funding, I think a pertinent question is whether privatization necessarily takes away some of the value of culture simply by changing and removing some of the traditional and local relations and connections between people and culture. In the context of museums, which are static displays of cultural objects and historical artifacts, not living cultural processes in a societal context, I think privatization could work without detracting from culture's inherent value. However, considering a broader range of cultural attractions, privatization seems to be counterproductive, actually stifling the process of culture. So I'd like to offer a slightly different definition of culture and cultural heritage to include this broader range using the concept of commons. I think the suggested definitions or inclusions Professor Settis has offered in the past do not go far enough in demonstrating the unique, def the unique nature of culture. Asking whether cultural heritage applies exclusively to the various art forms or should it include objects relating to history, religion, technology, craftsmanship, society, agriculture, industrial organization. This seems to offer an exhaustive list of potential objects and landmarks that can be included, but it says nothing of the processes involved and the relationships between people and a particular cultural environment. The Italian tradition mentioned of preserving objects in situ does recognize the importance of context for cultural heritage, but I think the value of culture lies much more in the processes involved in keeping it alive. The wealth, earlier described in terms of the economic benefits created by culture, is essentially a collective process, as highlighted by Negri and Hart. 
Besides museums, which do not generate wealth and really are dead in this cultural sense, other cultural attractions, such as theatre, as in Ms. Bailey's discussion, cannot be statically valued or commodified independently from the people who are part of their everyday activities and who contribute to the process that generates culture and has all of the knock-on wealth-creating effects that I mentioned earlier. So this shows that culture and cultural heritage, not, a, not as defined by objects or buildings, but as a commons, a living process, well demonstrated by Mr. Kang's Indian example of necklace necklace making. So the predatory goal of commodification sought, sought by capitalism and attempts at privatizing and appropriating this wealth stifles the process itself. Even from a broad economic perspective, we want to enhance this ongoing wealth generating process rather than commodify what it has already produced. This commons analysis shows an alternative understanding of wealth and value, which is particularly applicable to the cultural sector because by public investing in this area, the government is actually providing the tools and the structure by which this process of wealth generation can be perpetuated. The Commons presents a more systemic analysis of the problem, an alternative to capitalism. We must allow this collective Commons process to freely take place, even to produce these cultural objects and attractions in the first place, which then have this potential value and could be commodified. Thank you so much. It's, uh, um, it's very difficult to respond adequately to such a number of uh, um, individual and, and, and more general and systemic observations. Let me try to address a number of points very briefly as, uh, uh, as much as I can. First of all, I think that from uh, uh, the, the, the comments you were so kind to <coughs> give to my presentation. I think it is very clear that uh, a comparative approach, as many other, uh, as, as many other areas, is very useful and, and very productive in this, in, in this area too. And in, 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 in comparing particularly traditions from Europe, from continental Europe, with those of the United Kingdom, uh, that has a, a, in, a, in several respects, a, <coughs> a different tradition, but mostly uh, uh, European tradition with uh, those of other continents, not just America, but precisely great cultures such as India or China or Japan. This is, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, a, a, a comparison in conception of cultural heritage and landscape in its values from different points of view, uh, ethical, juridical, and, and political, is clearly very interesting and very productive. Particularly, let's, uh, let me just mention one case, the very idea of, uh, of conservation. The very idea of conservation is very different from, different, uh, from one country to another. In Japan, if you go to uh, one of the most sacred places in Japan, the sanctuary of Ise, uh, you find the most ancient temples of Japan. And most ancient of, uh, te temples of Japan are 20 years old because they are rebuilt every 20 years. So in that case, the notion of authenticity is linked not to the, concept, to the material conservation of that particular column or pediment, or whatever, but to the careful, extremely careful preservation over the centuries and millennia of the shape, of the form. So it's a totally different sense of authenticity. And it is impossible to say which is the right thing, way to do thing, because both are equally uh, authenticated by history. So I think that uh, um, in, in, in this respect, it is very important what has been said, I think, by Mr. Khan, that uh, the, um, uh, the cultural heritage 
and landscape, of, of course, cannot be taken as a static concept, but it's a continuous process. And in, in the continuous process, values are continuously adjusting to different societies and to different needs. So I think that this is the key point, the key point um, uh, and the relevance in terms of, 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 of value, as you, as, as you mentioned, the, the, which is the value of, uh, of cultural heritage in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of capital it could be taken as commodity. This is a, a recurrent temptation in our time where we, uh, we are even too inclined to put uh, a price on everything, including human beings. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this is a possibility and, uh, and many people think so, but there, is, there are other possibilities to think in terms of values. You mentioned scientific value, historical nature of citizenship, you, you, you mentioned cultural values. I think that the point, the key point is always, that's the reason why I, uh, I, 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 I tried to show very briefly uh, uh, a, a, a very complex history to show the accumulation of, not just of wealth in terms of, 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 uh, of money value of, those, of, 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 cultural, of cultural goods, of cultural heritage, but particularly in terms of value, the accumulation of values over time, and use cultural heritage to be put to implicitly or explicitly over, the, uh, over many centuries in, um, in, in, Italian, in Italian history. So there is an ongoing process of transformation of the objects themselves, and an ongoing process of transformation of values and of adaptation of values. And those two things are one. And we, 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 we have <coughs> to see them, I think, together. <coughs> Uh, the value of museums, uh, your observation was quite, uh, was quite interesting about uh, your, the, the, the value of museum in, in terms of bene comune and bene comune in relation to my, to my last book, which is a, uh, something I, I, didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't even mention in, uh, in, uh, in my presentation here. And uh, I, uh, m my point of view is that uh, um, when, when, I'm, uh, um, when I, 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 I try, I, I try to describe which might be the role, not necessarily of the state, but of public institution, most of Italian music, let me uh, just, just mention, most, probably 70% of um, uh, 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 of cultural heritage in Italy, and probably more, is private. I, I never said, and I never want, the private, I, I, I don't know about this building, probably this building is private. And there is nothing. I don't want to make the state own, owner of, of everything. The problem is whether or not everything should be private, whether or not the state should own something or nothing. And this is not something that we could uh, discuss only in relation to cultural heritage. The same thing is true for schools. Should schools be all privatized? Should schools be only for profit? Those are questions that uh, are, should libraries are only for, should we, we pay to consult a book in a library, in an archive? So it's a, a, a much more general question in which, uh, as one of you said, I might be optimistic. I, I'm not sure I'm optimistic. I may be more pessimistic than you think. Nevertheless, I think I can say what I, what I believe in, and from a systemic point of view, I, I think, and this is something I'm, I've, I've been arguing for in, in this book, that uh, uh, the idea of, of popular sovereignty, which is uh, very important in, uh, in, uh, in the last few centuries and very important in, our con in, in Italian constitution, the idea of popular sovereignty implies that uh, the sovereign is the people, so we, the citizens, that uh, laws are formulated by governments and parliament and, and so forth, but in our name, because it's the sovereign that promotes the laws, and the laws are made for our own rights, and in order to ensure 
the uh, relationship between the, the, a sovereignty that produces the laws and the citizens that are the, those who take benefit from the laws. We need, public institutions need a uh, number of assets that are what in Italy is called a demanio and public goods, the common goods. So I, I think that the function of, of, of a number of things are, must be related not only to a system of, uh, of, uh, of commodities or, or of, ma of markets, but also to a system of rights. This is a systemic statement that I cannot, uh, um, I cannot uh, uh, comment further on now, which is uh, mm, uh, uh, probably a, a statement of, 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 of principles and of principles how to achieve this, you ask me. How to achieve this is our, uh, our private uh, foundation, our, our foundations private or semi or semi private. The foundation here in Trino Museo Egizio is not necessarily a private foundation. It's something between public and private since. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm not opposed in principle to, to foundation provided they work. I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to those that that, that don't work like the one in, uh, in the Museo Egito that doesn't work at all for, for reasons I could, I, could, uh, I could analyze not today but in another context. So, uh, uh, and uh, here uh, the, uh, a, 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 um, uh, among Italian politicians, both at local and national level, there is a, a mythology according to which a simplification of the world, according to which in Italy everything is public, in the United States, which are the model, everything is private. So, in uh, most Italian um, politicians are convinced that American museums being private are for, are for profit, which is not true, which is not true, first of all. Second, it is not true that the American museums, which are mostly private, and I take the, the, the Getty Museum as my favorite example simply because I've been director of the Getty Research Institute, which is not part of the museum, but it's close by, and so it's in the same city, and, I, and I've been working close to it. So it's, it, it, it's totally different. In, in the case of, of, the, of, the, of the Getty Museum and many American museums, it was founded by a private person with a, a, an enormous... Uh, 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 enormous sum, which was initially slightly less than one billion dollars, and is now six, six billion or something like this, all from private source. So that's the reason why they don't pay. Uh, they, uh, they, do, uh, they, uh, they don't pay uh, uh, entrance tickets and so forth. And the, the entire system is based on the, uh, the, the assets and a good administration of those assets, a good investment. Which is, is not comparable with the with the with, uh, with the Italian system. Instead of Mr. Getty, we have what in the Uffizi? We have the city of Florence, from from early Middle Ages to a certain extent even the Roman Empire. We have the Medici, we have the Lorraine, we have the Kingdom of Italy. We have a long series, and we don't have. The Uffizi, they don't have a bank account. The Getty does have a bank account and does make. The, the Uffizi, they, they, don't, they don't make investments. In addition to, the, uh, to this, not the Getty, but other museums, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say Art Institute in Chicago or Metropolitan Museum, they do have their, uh, their own assets. They do receive donations. Donations which are linked to a system of, 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 of fiscal benefits, which in Italy is not in place. So, uh, the two systems can be compared, of course, but the comparison is not so simple. Private on one side, public on another side. That's the, 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 misunder the basic misunderstanding. And uh, speaking about being private or, 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 or being public or being state or being local, I would be is opposed to the uh, transformation of the National Museum in Rome in a, in a communal museum, in a museum of the, of the city of Rome, as I would be opposed in the transformation of the, the, the Capitoli Museum, which belongs to the city, in a statal museum. 
in, in, in the museum to the state. There are, there are different traditions with associations of values. So I, I think that uh, the uh, real point is to, is, is to see how the institutions, uh, the institutions are, are like human beings. They grow, they accumulate uh, identity, they accumulate wealth, they accumulate memory, and losing this memory, losing the memory of an institution is like for an individual losing a memory of the first, let's say, 10 years of his or her own life, which I think nobody, uh, nobody would, uh, would like to happen for him or herself. Now, costs and cuts. Costs and cuts. There are differences. In some instances, uh, President Obama, uh, speaking to the American Academy of Sciences, said that in a period of crisis, it's time of investing more in culture, in research. That's a conception. Uh, according to Berlusconi, in a time of crisis, uh, it's time to cut, particularly in culture, research, school, museums, and whatever. There are two different conceptions, and it will take a long time to analyze them. But uh, even without going as, as, as far as Washington, D.C., Let's, go, let's move to a, a, a country which is very similar to Italy, in France, in Sarkozy, in, in the France of Sarkozy. A right-wing government, basically. They didn't cut in uh, their funding in museums. They, they said the, in, the, uh, in a speech which uh, I've been listening to by the former minister Mitterrand, uh, he said uh, the, the funding in museums and culture are sanctuarize, like a sanctuary, not one penny less, as a reaction to the crisis. Italy cut. So there is not, there is not a law of nature by which there is the crisis, you cut. There is the crisis, you, you privatize. Everything can be discussed. Why not? But taking into account that there are alternative models. And what is the main peculiarity of, 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 uh, of Italy today? Certainly an economical crisis that uh, is uh, um, deeper than the one in France, although of the same nature, but with a peculiarity which uh, we cannot hide. And peculiarity is that the, the, the high one of the highest level worldwide of tax evasion. You know that uh, in the uh, Transparency International made a uh, list of, uh, uh, of states worldwide where citizens don't pay taxes, taxes they should pay. First, Mexico, second, Turkey worldwide, third, Italy. How much did we Italians, we Italians are very good at not paying taxes. For instance, in, in 2011, 147 billion euros of unpaid taxes. In 2012, 154 billion euros unpaid taxes. So, I, I don't buy the idea that we don't have money. We don't want to have money because we are protecting those who don't want to pay taxes. So, uh, it's impossible. What I'm trying to say is that addressing the, the problem of the cost of cultural heritage as a very small portion, as a, 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 a slice of a very large cake without looking at the rest of the cake is a, 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 a real mistake. We have to look systematically at the entire thing and we have to ask the questions, do we have the money for schools, for uh, uh, university, research, museums, hospitals, uh, and whatever, for social, uh, for social spending of different sorts? Do we have the money or not? But we have to ask uh, uh, simultaneously where, why do we pay more taxes, more, uh, more percentage of our, of our uh, income in, in taxes than an average American citizen? Because in the United States, they on average, you on average pay more, pay taxes more often and have 
much less tax evasion than, than, than in, in Italy. So we have to take the entire, and I, uh, I think that the, the cost, the issue of costs of, uh, of, uh, of cultural heritage cannot be uh, separated from the general issue of the, how public institutions work or, or don't work. And, uh, for, for, um, and finally, the last point, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, um, I'm just, I'm just mentioning some points of those, of, of the many you, you touched upon. Uh, I think that uh, if, as, uh, as all of you basically said, value of cultural heritage lies in the process itself, which I believe is true. Now, the issue of privatization or not privatization of what is public, of what uh, uh, was transmitted to a from a generation to another as public, this issue should be addressed within the general framework of this principle. Values, value lies, or cultural heritage lies in the process. Now, did, did we come to a point in this process that we have to privatize, that this is the only solution? This would mean that we came in, our, in, our, in the process of uh, uh, understanding value to a point in which we only uh, think of cultural heritage in terms of commodity. So if commodification is a process we cannot uh, we, we cannot fight against, probably pr privatization is the solution. If there is something, some other order of value to live in, uh, this is not necessarily the possible solution. In Italy, given the Article 9 of the Constitution, which I mentioned, given the general system of our Constitution, we have a further problem, the, the, we, which is the problem of respecting the law. And we need to respect the law in a country where uh, which is also very high, I don't remember exactly at which point in the uh, Transparency in, in International Classification of Corruption. Uh, I only remember that Italy is, is at the same level in corruption as Ghana uh, in, the, in, the class, in, the, in, the, uh, in the classification made by, by, by Transparency International. So I think that if we want to respect the law, I, I think if we want to respect the Constitution, we have to still be not necessarily optimistic, but uh, uh, perhaps even if we are pessimistic, we have to fight for the law against those who don't, uh, uh, who don't want the law uh, and uh, for the, the efficiency and, uh, and functioning and, uh, and correct functioning of the, of, of the public institution, including in the sector of the public, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the cultural heritage. And, uh, so that, that, uh, so that, uh, this is my point. And I think that uh, the, uh, the idea for privatization, just to conclude, is something that is uh, uh, irresponsible because the, the uh, Italian cultural heritage is so huge that it is unthinkable that it would be privatized. In privatization in Italy means not creating not-for-profit organizations such as the Getty, but uh, those who want to privatize the cultural heritage in Italy, they want to do for profit, which means that only one or two places, the Coliseum and Pompeii, perhaps the Uffizi could offer profit to the private investors who could uh, take care of them, while the, the other 10,000 museums and, or, or, uh, or, or monuments all over, uh, all over Italy would be, would be totally abandoned. And I'm uh, a bit optimistic or pessimistic. I'm not inclined to think this is the right thing to do. Thank you. <coughs> Grazie a tutti per i loro interventi e particolarmente al professor Settis per il vero regalo che ci ha fatto. Uh, thank you everyone for your interventions and
particularly Professor Settis for the real gift he gave us. Eh, arrivederci e credo che abbiamo concluso una bella giornata. Grazie. Thank you.